I'm Sir Flobojan Thunderhammer. And I'm Teflon Frosthammer. And I'm Cabbage Tidehammer. And this is Whack. If Ampguard Knighthood means anything, you can't knife a motherfucker and keep it. And the thing that people need to understand essentially about arts and sciences events is that your scores don't matter. Do you want a black phoenix or a white phoenix? Jeez, language, man. We're yeah, on right. a freaking podcast, for fuck's sake. Mind-blowing experience, right? Hello, everyone, and welcome to WACT, where we discuss topics important to the AmpGuard community at large and talk with interesting people from around the foam fighting world. But this week, we're not actually talking to someone from around the foam fighting world. We are talking with someone from SCA. I'm going to see if how badly I mess your name up. Um, Tristan Vaughn. Uh, Jaeger von Bonn. Tristram Jaeger. Tristram Jaeger von Bonn. Oh. Okay, so I'm going to call you Tristram. Thank you so much. <laughs> this is actually a member of the SCA community at our local SCA park here, the Barony of Thor's Mountain. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, that's a killer name. It's fun. <laughs> yeah, What's I, that? Barony of Thor's Mountain? Yeah, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, li- we like it. It sort of uh, influences a lot of people's uh, personas here, too, locally. And you see that in the SCA overall. I can see that, yeah. Because if people are, like, say, on the West Coast and they have a very uh, Japanese-esque name, Barony or Shire, then a lot of people sometimes uh, mimic that with uh, Japanese personas, for example. So oh. it, it, it it can influence it, and kingdoms have colors, and that influences a lot of stuff as well. That's cool. That's so, it's very deep. It's hard. Kind of, you, could, you could have talk about that for, like, half an hour easy. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start with the most basic thing. Let's assume that our viewers are not as familiar with SCA. Oh, Tell I'm not. Me, so we don't yeah. have to assume anything. <laughs> <laughs> Teflon definitely isn't. So uh, introduce SCA to me as if I was a new person that was walking up. Sure, like elevator pitch. Well, um, it is realistically a uh, it's a not-for-profit organization, so that's so- sort of weird and nebulous for people. But basically, it's about recreating the Middle Ages. Um, the, good, the good parts of that. Um, the term living the dream is sort of uh, kind of the motto. Uh, It's been around since I think 66. So in in most regards, it is the grandfather to all the LARPs you guys know. It's way older. I say that might be be the oldest one. Yeah, Yeah, definitely. I would would probably think it would be. Uh, um, I mean, you could think there would probably be groups in like Europe that have, you know, that are recreation things are older, but it's Europe after all, not America. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's realistically recreating anything you want to recreate of the medieval era, right? Um, it, whether you want to learn how to make nails like a certain Viking village made at a particular time, people, there's someone out there who knows how to do it and will teach you, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and it's just like the good stuff of it all. I mean, we certainly do uh, acknowledge that there were bad things like the plague and stuff like that. And people sometimes have uh, fun with that kind of thing. Um, but it's really just recreating the Middle Ages. It's really about learning from other people and teaching. Um, and there's a lot of components like service, like you guys have, yeah. uh, arts and sciences, the fighting arts, uh, live weapons, equestrian, um, falconry. I mean, I uh, Pretty much a, a gobs of things. Falconry, uh, cor- coursing, coursing with hounds. Yeah, yeah all cool. those things. Yeah. So I want to go into uh, a lot of what you just now said, but <laughs> I want to touch on some places where we're very familiar, where where Amp Guard has borrowed from our. I think it was our Daga here roots, and then it Dag had borrowed from SCA originally, and that mm-hmm. is that, as I have understood it, you are structured into kingdoms just like Amp Guard is. Mm-hmm. And that under those kingdoms, you have shires and baronies and all of that, just like we do. Is, for us, the title of your park, whether you're a shire or a barony or a duchy or anything like that, is determined by the number of people that you have showing up weekly. Is it the same for SCA? No. Um, it is certainly, there is certainly an aspect of active membership. But the park itself, you know, it doesn't even matter where it is. Uh, we, we floated around this this summer once we started up again after COVID. Yeah. Um, that really has nothing to do with anything. It's just active membership. So you've got uh, tons of active members who just do sub- service stuff or just do arts. Um, that's probably the lion's share of it is non-fighters, people that don't show up to the park and fight. Um, 
but it, it is it is related to population and uh, we do do sign in sheets for stuff and keep track of that but it's not as hardcore as like you guys as i understand it um yeah a lot of our privileges and abilities to give out things like awards are predicated on how many people attend uh on a, on a regular like six month rolling period so right that right does make and a significant difference for us the only time really the only time like baronies or anything get downgraded is due to like severe like something super severe there was something that happened in the murfreesboro nashville area years and years ago uh that caused like a huge rift and that like basically made the barony go away um at least as as it was um you get things called even called cantons which are a subset of the barony it's its own little group it doesn't have its own money the barony owns the money holds the money for it but the canton can do whatever it wants for it um, shires are sort of they're not in baronies technically you know there's a lot of stuff but kingdoms never go away unless they get reorged um, like for example the kingdom we're in is the kingdom of meridiates um, it's basically most of tennessee uh, uh, georgia alabama um, where am i thinking where am i missing you got Kentucky, mm-hmm. South Carolina. A little nibble of Kentucky, mm-hmm. a little nibble of the panhandle of Florida. And okay. that's a, that's Meridia's. But before, it was bigger, and it got broken up because it was too big. It was all the way out to Arkansas. Oh, wow. Mississippi, Louisiana. You know, it was a huge kingdom. But it sort of – there is some population uh, thought on that mm-hmm. um, because, like, the East Kingdom is part of the East Coast, and that's a huge population density. Uh, and there are some thoughts on travel times to events. You know, yeah. kingdoms want to be sort of self-sufficient in that degree. So if your travel time is like eight from one end to the other is eight hours, that kingdom is probably too big unless it doesn't have a lot of population. And then you kind of, I'm sure there's a lot of thought goes into it. I, I'm not super privy to all that, but there's some balancing act there. No, that makes that. sense. So your your kingdoms are then geographically organized. They're not like right. um, okay. So it's very similar to how Amthgard is. You actually have a similar territory to what our kingdom does. Um, right. When you when you talk about kingdoms and and you mentioned events, um, how how many kingdoms are there first off, and then how many events roughly does each kingdom have? Um. Uh, well, I'm going to answer the second the second question first. Okay. I, I arguably there's almost an event in each kingdom every weekend. Oh wow! With the with huh? few exception with few exceptions, some holidays and stuff like that, and they even do like super uh, events where there's two events combined. Like we call it Artsy Crown. It's arts and, an artsy science event and Crown List. They do that on Labor Day, or they did traditionally oh, wow. because it's a four day weekend. So they could do half the weekend, two days with one event, and the other two days for the other event. Oh, that's really cool. And make it like a super super event, which is turnouts huge on those kinds of things. Um, number of kingdoms. I, you're going to call me on that. I'm trying to, I'm trying to scrabble. I think it's like 13 and no. there's like at least one or two principalities out there. Gotcha. No, that's fine. Um, it was just a question because Anthgard has 23 or 22 kingdoms. And that gives you a rough idea of like how large a kingdom can be. So for Anthgarders knowing there's 13, each kingdom op- occupies a little bit more territory than a, a traditional Anthgard kingdom. That's good to know. Well, one kingdom, Drakenwald is Europe. Oh, but all of Europe. All of Europe is Drakenwald. So it's like Texas, right? No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Te- Texas and Stiora, they, they don't let you forget it. It's like, you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> um, there's a kingdom. Kingdom of the West is like California. It's uh, it's. I think it's actually not California. I think it's north of California. And technically can encompass like Japan and other places so it's a lot of pacific oh, wow. e- oh, really there neat. are air there are sca groups on aircraft carriers that have events on the aircraft carrier that seems- and they're part of the, and if they're doing a westpac they're kingdom of the west you know what i'm saying so yeah. it's just like gonzo there's a <laughs> yeah there's <laughs> a relatively new group i think they're just a bar- they're just a barony um that is in thailand and also another one that's in China. Oh, that's uh, that's wow. sick. The, a lot of us have like a dream to go to the one in Thailand. First off, just to go to Thailand and visit. Uh, you know, I've been there as part of the military, but to go there and garb and fight with all these people from Thailand would be phenomenal. That's, I'm yeah, sure the food, yeah. food food would be off the hook too, of course. Yeah. 
Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's all over the world. And that's the thing. It's like, I think there's like 30,000 plus members worldwide. So I know that, I know that Lucas wants to get to another question, but I think that there's an important distinction to make before we move on here. Cause we were talking about events first, how much does it cost to get into one of your events? If someone was interested in going and second, our game does not have a cost simply to play simply to fight. And as I've understood, your game does. Could you talk me through that? Um, there is a membership. Again, the answer in reverse order. There is a membership. You don't have to be a member to play, but it does ultimately uh, give you uh, discounts. Uh, vendors give you discounts for that. Certain events, yeah. you get discounts for that. Uh, I think it ultimately ends up being like sort of a weird liability thing. If you're, if you're a member, you have... Uh, you've signed it off that says, I know this is something that can have, you know, physical activity, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. When you're a non-member, you still have to sign that list, except for you don't get a, you pay a little bit of a surcharge at events to cover liability. That makes sense. Um, yeah. And some vendors give great discounts. And I know you guys get, uh, you know, if you go to Tandy Leather and say, I'm, I'm an SCM member, I think you guys maybe have worked out a similar deal. You're at a, like a silver level of membership as an SCM member. Oh, neat. You know, yeah. that's a great, huge discount if you do a lot of leatherworking. That's um, super cool. Um, there, to The costs really depend on the type of event. So we do have day trip events mm -hmm. with no food, no feast. Um, those are relatively uh, inexpensive. Um, I would say the average for most weekend events is probably like $25, $30. Pretty in line now, with us. Yeah. But you got to depending on that that actually gives you depending and it might be just a skosh more than that but you get feasts with that cost yeah mm -hmm. and our feasts are nothing to sneer at they are like three to five course feasts and i'm talking like with roasted lamb and everything you can think of multiple <laughs> that's course not like feasts. us at all <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's it, not it, true it, we've it, had that before yeah <laughs> but it, it's like you know just like crazy stuff it's mostly most people try to cook period ish within limits because the modern palate you know really can't stand some of that stuff <laughs> some of the old stuff ah you yes know. mutton today i mean i i did cook a feast once and i know i know i'm sort of get off topic but no please we it's did an we did an italian feast with uh, this lady and we cooked all kinds of stuff and most of it we knew was going to be good but there's this um kind of fish stew we made which had scallops and had shrimp and had uh octopus and had all kinds of stuff in it and we knew basically on the way it was cooked it was going to be polarizing we knew that yeah going in we're like well half the people are going to love it half the people are going to hate it and so that's kind of you have to take that gamble for the purpose of the doing the feast correctly if yeah. that makes sense yeah now you've talked about the the fee, so I, I assume that's uh, for the the money. Do you just get the one meal that way, or is there like a uh, lunch and breakfast or stuff like that that it, is it, included with the ticket? That's a great question. For usually weekend events, like usually like uh, event we have coming up called Silver Hammer, which is coming up in October. That's usually a weekend event that we stay, stay the weekend. Now this this Silver Hammer is not going to be a weekend event. It's going to be a day trip just because of COVID measures and things right. like that. It just cost wise, we're not sure it's going to show up. But typically, your feast does get you breakfast on Saturday morning, a full X course feast on Saturday night, and then some food and stuff on Sunday morning as well, as, as well as uh, all the coffee you can drink and all that stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, you know, we, we line it up and actually amazingly enough for all that per person, I think the feasts end up being plus the two breakfasts and even travelers fair. Sometimes on Friday night, as people coming in, there's a travelers fair set up, mm -hmm. but a lot, usually that feast budget is, with all that is like maybe nine fifty a person. Damn. So you're paying nine dollars and fifty cents a person to have a five course feast, where you will eat. If you're not careful, you'll go crazy the first three, and you've got two more to go. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, and you're like, oh my god. I've been I in mean, that situation too many times. <laughs> I can see. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't even get to make the fat joke this time. <laughs> uh, I, I can't stuck. say much. I can't say much. I, uh, was good. I, was I good. represent as well. Actually, funny enough, because uh, you do, you used to play at the same park that that our Amp Guard Park meets. You actually told uh, Flo and I about Jackie's dream. 
Oh, um, mm-hmm. local local soul food chicken joint has Nashville hot chicken uh, or Knoxville hot chicken, and Knoxville that place hot, is yeah. fucking good. So yeah. thanks for that recommendation, by the way. Any anyone ever coming through Knoxville? Uh, stop at Jackie's. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, really good, really good local joint. Awesome lady. I knew her from when she worked at Crown and Goose. No way. That's cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it, and actually, the Knoxville hot give a plug is actually the better version. Way better version than any of the Nashville Hots. I agree. Agreed. Yeah, it's phenomenal. Get at me, Nashville. Please. <laughs> um, so you actually mentioned uh, something about you know historical or, or recipes and, and making them historically. Um, mm. And first off, there's a, a YouTube channel called Tasting History with Max Miller where yeah, he, he makes cool. historic recipes. And about half the recipes, he's like, oh, this is pretty good. And then the other half of them, he's like, this is garbage. Don't eat this. <laughs> because he makes them, he will actually have somebody help translate them and you know, actually try to replicate the, the original ingredients, things like that. Um, but the, um, the sort of sticking to history, I know SCA stands for, correct me if I'm wrong, Society for Creative Anachronism. Mm-hmm. It's that last one that gets me. It's too many syllables. Um <laughs> I know you guys try to stack, uh, stick to some historical accuracy where you can. Where are the bounds of that? Like, I know in your garb, you try to, to you know, not show logos and things like that. How far does that go? Uh, the joke is like a 10-foot rule, 10 or 15-foot rule <laughs> is sort of the like joke, that. you know. And, and, and obviously, especially with, say, an aging population, there are, you know, someone's wearing orthopedic shoes, completely fine. If you're if you're wearing glasses, you're not going to be burned as a witch. Completely fine, you know, just those <laughs> kinds of things. And you know, uh, and f- from a combat sports standpoint, you know, we've got what four different types of combat now. There are some modern conveniences from that standpoint that uh, just make sense to have underneath or even mildly visible because it's just about safety, you know. What's the uh, kind of- four categories? I only know of like I guess heavy and fencing, I think, or something yeah, like so- that. Armor combat, which is also known as heavy. So they used to call rapier, which is fencing, light fighting versus heavy fighting because it was opposed. It's sort of a weird dichotomy <laughs> there. But uh, rapier, uh, there's also a, a, a middle sort of, I would say it's a bridge uh, sport called uh, cut and thrust. It lets you use metal weapons, but in a percussive manner. So you could pull a manual from anywhere in history and be able to fight as long as you have the safety gear on with that manual. Oh, um, and then there's, uh, they added a new, um, I'm going to, I can't remember the official title, but they added a, effectively a live weapons fighting style as well. Wow. So it's even, it's sort of uh, even arguably heavier than heavy is, than armored combat is. This would be like uh, armored combat league or something like that. Closer but... to that. Yeah. Yeah. Closer okay. to that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I, and just real quickly to go through the differences. So that is a great example that, that live steel is more like armor combat. They're using metal weapons. Um, their armor requirements are a lot higher, mm-hmm. uh, because of that. Um, I don't actually know it off the top of my head. I don't know when he was doing it yet, but armor combat, we use a rattan, uh, mostly use rattan for the sword simulator. Mm-hmm. So with rattan, it's it sort of looks like bamboo on the outside, but it's thick, thick, uh, fibrous stuff. It'll give you a bruise quicker than anything if you get hit un- unarmored. Um, and it's got armor requirements for safety: your knees, elbows, uh, uh, hands, cup, of course, kidney, head, neck, etc. Rapier is using a metal rapier. Um, there are some different flavors of stuff in there, but it's mostly the pokies and some draw cuts. Okay. And then cut and thrust, like I said, it's a bridge thing. You have to have some mild armoring on your knees or and elbows, um, some puncture resistant like the rapier has. And you can, again, you can be percussive or thrust as well with that. So there are four combat forms that can fit your flavor. You know, if you want to be just go out and do a sport, you know, armor combat's closer to a sport. Right. Uh, C&T lets you do period stuff. Rapiers were sport centric as well. Yeah, I know with cut yeah. and thrust, you mentioned like getting manuals and and sort of following that. Is that is that just cut and thrust that does that, or is it any of them where you're trying to imitate that? I I think you're going to get with rapier. You, there are some manuals you could do a portion of, but some of those period manuals, uh, with the exception of most Italian, there were percussiveness to it. Well, that was not allowed in rapier. It's really about the Italian style. The 
the premise of the point. I can thrust into your heart and kill you from, you know, six feet away. Um, so that's the bulk of what it was, but now you're starting to get more, uh, little overlap in that. So if you don't, if you want to study more period stuff and deep percussive, you can jump over to the cut and thrust world, or we call it just CNT to be able to do that style of combat okay. and explore that. So this is one point that I want to, uh, uh, to, to really bring out here too. Everything that was just mentioned is equipment that you will be required to get before you are allowed to get certified, which is the SCA's version of uh, making it to where you can go on the field to fight. Have I understood that correctly? Yeah, yes. Uh, we uh, we call it authorization, um, but any of the weapons form, you have to have make sure you have the right amount, of, the right equipment, um, you're s proven to be safe. And that's really the crux of the authorization is to prove you're safe doing the particular form, whatever that is. Um, with uh, rapier, there's different authorizations based on a weapons form. With armored combat or heavy fighting, there's sword and board. You know, sword and shield is the default authorization. Right. In our kingdom, other than that, you can go at what you're authorized in that. You can fight whatever the hell you want. That's normally heavy fighting. And actually, different kingdoms handle it differently. You, there is an overarching SCA rule set. So SCA.org has its own rule set, but the kingdoms can actually vary that as long as they're being more severe they can't get less severe but they can be more severe on the rules that makes sense so they yeah. can require more you know checks and balances based on it um and that's part of the membership actually supports the organization the uh uh you know the actual office that's in california somewhere okay okay so yeah I, that was actually a question i had here was was rule book that's all i had written yep. down um and the amp guard rules of play are 200 something pages. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I know. I know well, we can look it up. How long is your rule book? Like what, what do we cover in that rule book other than like rules of combat? Each discipline has, you know, if you're doing just a combat, each discipline has its own rule book. Oh, shit. Um, there are some things that are not arguably not in the rule book, which are like best practices, you know, <laughs> that are really discussed. You know how that goes. Yeah. Um, you know, but there are just some rule sets in there. But each one, I could think, but could be, you know, but I, some like we did a re overhaul of our rules, and what they did is they basically they cheated. I would say cheated. They did a smart thing. They said, look at the SA rules, and then here's our addendum, and they made a small list versus reprinting the whole bloody thing. So yeah. it was easier to do that. So that made it like, you know, thirty, forty, fifty pages to like a short amount of pages, like Jeez. three or something like that. And that's a smart way to go, of course. Um, we don't have to deal with gamification at all. So the rules are just about what's safe, what equipment you have to have, um, what's considered a good blow, especially if you're talking about the armor combat or the rapier or either any of the any of the any of the combat at all. Oh, I, I didn't. Also, you can technically do armor combat uh, and rape uh, just armor combat. I don't think the live weapons does it yet, or CNT, but you can do armor combat on horseback as well. What? Oh. <laughs> Holy shit! <laughs> you mentioned falconry earlier, and now mounted combat like equestrian. Fuck. Equestrian games are a big thing too. You know, it's a and to talk about a gear intensive sport. Ooh. Yeah, gotta, no joke. Yeah, but um, you can do uh, with the equestrian games. There's a ton of stuff people do. They play, you know, uh, a lot of the old school uh, tilting games and all this stuff like that. But you can actually fight on horseback. That's an authorization as well to be able to do that. So you, you can imagine how much effort it would be to do that. Though. Is it just like lance-based combat, or is it actually like sword and shield kind of combat too? Sword, or? sword and shield. Okay. No. They do. There is jousting, but it's done a little different than like the stuff you see at Ren Fairs. Sure. Yeah, understandable. Yeah. The uh, I know this too from uh, watching videos of Penzik. Penzik is mm -hmm. one of your big events that. Uh, the very large SE events have ambulances that are often on site. You can see them in the background of some of the videos. Penzik, legit, uh, like I used to go to Penzik a lot once I had a kid. That's sort of where it lines up with the school years. <laughs> sucks. Uh, but they legit have a full time uh, um, building dedicated to them where they have medics all the time. So oh, if you wow. have heat issues, you can go there. 
So the ambulances are just a small portion of the medical uh, effort there. You're talking like, I mean, the biggest one I camped at had a little over 13,000 people camping at Pensick. Jesus. And that's like the whole place, you know, down in the bog, we call the bog where the, you know, it's everywhere with uh, up to, uh, and I was thinking about this the other day because I know uh, trying to think about how to tell you guys about, guys about this. But like the field battles, you know, the big big field battle, two sides opposing, like Braveheart or whatever, coming together. Each side probably has around a thousand people on each side fighting, and we're talking slamming each other, you know, pell mell happening. There's <laughs> you know those kinds of things. It's a blast to watch. It's a blast to be in as well. Is the the rules? Because I see a lot of one v one kind of combat mm -hmm. locally, right? Yep. Um, is the rules for the big combat uh, with multiple people different than the 1v1 combat rules? It's sort of the same. You know, because you're doing 1v1, you never really stab someone in the back. Sure. So in melee, you never really stab someone in the back. You know, you do basically go, hey, d hey, dummy, I'm right here. Hey, <laughs> yeah. little tap on the helmet. <laughs> they go, oh, yeah, I'm dead. Um, you know, things like that. Um, th there, there are some rule sets, like we try to, let people know we're there. We don't blindside them. And that's true on the rapier field as well. When we do rapier melee, gotcha. Um, you kind of give them a chance to be able to defend themselves because you could, you know, I've gotten behind lines before and I could just have murdered 80 people without them knowing. Yeah. You know, literally 80 people I could have murdered. Mm -hmm. um, but you kind of give them a chance. You, uh, you do this whole uh, 180 arc. You, you have to try to be in a 180 arc if you're going to engage them. Gotcha. Kind of thing like that. So that's the big thing on that. And uh, usually with one on one, that's not an issue because they're usually in your 180 arc anyways. Unless they do something stupid and spin around, you just hit them anyways. You know? <laughs> I had people do that. We're like, I'm going to do a spin thing. I'm like, gonk. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then what are you doing? Yeah, it's it's pretty cool. Those are all um, your crossover amp guarders that are moving into SCA. <laughs> that's yeah. By yeah. the way, SCA and Amp Guard is known as the uh, once you get your belt in Amp Guard, you go to it's where knights go to die. Um, they <laughs> oh, the SCA is. Yeah, yeah, they go over to SCA so they can get their knighthood there too. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. That was a question I had. Was I understand SCA has some form of knighthood? I've heard knighthood and I've heard laurel thrown around, and I don't mm -hmm. know the difference. Um, explain that to me. Just what are those values? How do they work? There are peerages, what we call peerages. So knighthood's one of those. Um, there's there's uh, four different peerages right now. There's being a knight, being a pelican, which is about uh, service, being a laurel, which is about arts and sciences, and uh, being a master of defense, which is about rapier. Oh, okay. Oh, so you, you have know. two for combat, but different forms of... Or is, is knight not combat specific? It is combat specific. Okay. But there's also the whole, if you're a knight, you've done service, and you you teach people and you've got the peer like qualities and that's sort of the weird thing about uh being a knight in the sca is um there's this whole concept of peer like qualities that they want people to have no matter what discipline they're in and whatever that means it's all it's pretty nebulous i'm sure you maybe you guys run into it we, but yeah. absolutely we do, yeah. we do. Yeah. yes yeah and it's it's you know you could you could be a shit hot fighter mm -hmm. and you could still never get yeah know, inducted into that yeah. Okay. So I mean, so far I'm I'm actually hearing more similarity between SCA and Ampguard than I heard between DAG and Ampguard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we picked up a lot of your, uh, a lot of the 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 negative aspects of your game <laughs> carried <laughs> out. <laughs> we we well. ripped off a lot of your game. Is what it sounds like when Ampguard needs mounted combat. And and yeah, and I miss it. <laughs> I miss that we picked up on the really good uh, aspects of your uh, your game too. With that many people at an event, I have to imagine that. You have uh, just walking around. Your your vendors row must be amazing. Walking around from camp to camp must be fun. Yeah, it is. It is amazing. If, to use Penzi example, Gulf Wars is another one, a big one I go to. That's uh, usually in uh, March in Mississippi, so that's a good time of year to go down there because it's definitely not hot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but you you set up discrete camps. Each you know camps can be like from a barony can be just a household what we call households uh you know aggregate of people and those are self-contained areas um they uh the good ones have shower hot showers in there no shit. um uh a full kitchen if you will not like a real you know huge kitchen but a kitchen to cook real stuff mm -hmm. um 
you know, it, uh, the, the big difference between like Penzik is no land can be claimed ever permanently. Whereas okay. at Gulf Wars, you can actually, a group can, if you've improved the land, you can claim that and you can keep that piece of land forever. Oh, that's really As long cool. as you have attendance on it and, and improve it. Hmm. Um, and that's the cool thing. So you can invest in that down there, but you do become self-contained. Um, you just have many feasts, feasts every night or re- not many real feasts every night plus whatever. I like that part. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's, and I think some camps want to push you towards being a little authentic if they're, if that's how they lean. So they want people to have, you know, medieval tents, canvas tents. I was about like to that. ask that. No Coleman yeah. tents or anything. Uh, we call it earth, our earth pimples is what they call the yeah. little guys that lay yeah. down there. I love but those, that. you know, people, yeah, p- people, you know, we know about economics and people don't have all the money in the world to spend on those things. Cause those tents get, can run up to be pretty pricey. They're like bottom edge. If I remember right, is like three, 400 bucks or something like that. For most of them that I've seen anyway. I remember there was a, uh, one of the, one of the tent sites that I think that I, I got from you um, makes amazing tents, mm-hmm. but they were like three or four thousand dollars. Yeah, you can you can run it up, dude. You can run it up. Yeah, I, mean, I wanted one. I've always wanted to own a yurt, so like this isn't unselling yurts, me. Yurts are cool, and they you know if you do it right, they break down pretty. Well. And that's the other thing is like because you have such a big tent and wooden poles, and with yurts you've got the a uh, camera. Well, it's not a hakama, but it's the uh, the outer wall, the the, yeah, the, like the lattice, outer wall. The yeah. lattice, thing, yeah, lattice right? thing that you can break down and all that stuff storing it. So you definitely have to have a vehicle that can deal with it. Yeah. So once you start committing to that, you you got to have like a vehicle can pull a trailer or have a big old bed in it and a rack on top. So you know, <laughs> for me and my wife and kid, because we we go down to Gulf Wars when when we can. You know, it's like her truck and a big trailer just full of stuff. And it takes us like several hours to actually unpack, set the tent up and several hours, you know, <laughs> and fl- and then on the flip side, do the same thing when we're, before we're leaving to come back home. Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's a, you know, you know, part of that is me too, because I like the Tetris. So I like to fiddle with <laughs> packing. <laughs> um but it makes it easier overall. But yeah, you, you can have to commit to those kinds of things. So the camps are insane and the merchants row, like at Penzik, I kind of joke, you could, you could probably spend a million dollars there and I, I have, have to I drive have away that much money, but <laughs> yeah, you could pro- probably spend a million dollars and walk away with pretty much the best of everything. And, and maybe not even have bought man, everything from every vendor. Cause it's insane. Wow. Um, I mean, it's, it's as big as probably, I just, I, I don't have a sense of how big your guys' events are, but Merchant Row is probably as big as, you know, some of your events. Yeah, um, I would imagine so. I, yeah. A couple hundred people, uh, yeah. you know, in, yeah, in, that's, that's, that's the number of, that's not even the number of the merchants at Pensick, for damn. example. <laughs> <God>. <laughs> so, so I, as a as a, a newbie to SEA, like I've seen you guys playing at the park, and mostly mm-hmm. like I say, hey, and then I, I walk on to the the Amp Guard side of the park because we have turf wars. Um, <laughs> but, but well, I mean, we obviously won. We don't have to walk as far. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, you guys have the, the bigger <laughs> sticks in the rattan. Yeah. Ours are foam. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, how does a newbie get in? So like, I've walked past you guys, and I'm like, oh, I don't have the armor to to deal with that. I'm gonna keep on moving. Like, how does a, a new player who's interested in this do they just walk up and say, hey, I'm new? Do you have that's loaner literally, equipment? That's or? literally it. We have equipment um, oh. for we have loaner gear for uh, both armored and for rapier. I actually uh, am the rap the rapier marshal, so I have a whole set of gear. I have actually probably like four or five sets of gear for new people to show up and try it out. And we realistically want just people to show up and come and be social. And if they want to try it out, they can. We have the gear for that. Um, it's always ill fitting. It's the best we've got. But it's sort of a, in a in a funny way, kind of motivation to get you to get your own stuff. <laughs> That's what I was about to say. Yeah, like yeah. this helmet rattles. Let me get my own. Yeah, I so, don't really like the weight of this. It's making my head do this, you know. And yeah. you're, you're like, yep. I'll say too that uh, after joining your uh, your Facebook group, there are a lot of SCA Facebook groups and other SCA group organizations where you can get used gear. That is mm-hmm. really good gear. I have found like used SCA gear on shopgoodwill.com before. Oh, really? I've seen yeah, you see that. Glo- yeah, yeah. Huh. Some people will will snag those and post on on some of the SCA groups. Like, is this anyone's gear? Because stuff gets stolen, and I'm sure you guys run into that too. But yeah. when you're talking like, I have a helmet in my car, which 
you know, I'm going to take out after that before this is published on air. <laughs> <laughs> but I have a helmet in my car that's worth like I think I paid. I don't remember how much I paid for it, but I have sword. I have two swords each that are worth of them was five hundred dollars each. Mm-hmm. You know, rapier swords, and I have a helmet that's worth a, a de- decent chunk of change. So, yeah, gear. You know, it's sort of that weird thing because if you have the ability to pay for it, you're going to get better gear. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, when you start off, your stuff is trash. Like my first helmet, what it rang like a, a it rang like the biggest bell you've ever heard dude it was terrible oh that must and suck, i paid hardly headed. anything for it yeah that has yeah to so suck. It, it's it's a target <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> like i, I about that i got hit so hard that i had that gunshot off you know that gunshot sound yeah yeah that i i for like three weeks later i wear an, wore an earplug in that ear or the both ears as i practiced and got better at it so i wouldn't have that you know my you know losing my hearing even more than i already am losing it yeah <laughs> So like that was have- like 180. It was like a 180 dollar helmet that probably probably was too thin. I probably should have been fighting in it. <laughs> but you know, whatever. Well, I mean, more than anything, too, when it's the gear that that's actually keeping you safe, you get what you pay for, right? Like, yeah, spending more money hasn't been. And, yeah. And Amthgard, there's a finite limit to how much money you can put into something before it stops being maybe worth it. Yeah. Um. You know, there's. But there's- in, our, in ours, we could we could dial that up. Like. Yeah. I could got if I wanted to, and I in you know I could buy a full gothic plate with golden lay do people do that? are there people I, that do that so leaf sir uh, leroy before he died uh bought a helmet that was a fully engraved helmet from one of the helmet makers that's really really famous in the sca uh, i think they're out in colorado or something like that it had gold inlay in it Jeez. um it was full viking themed and I want to say that it was thirty eight hundred dollars or more. That's a car. That's a car. That's a car. <laughs> I, I that is a used Honda Fit. I I hope I'm not exaggerating that. I'm certainly not trying to. I know that it was a, an extremely expensive helmet, and it was also probably one of the most well crafted and beautiful pieces of uh, uh, medieval technology, really, that I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. Yeah, there's some good craftsmen out there, and it's like everything under the sun you can buy, you know. <laughs> so as much money as you want, <laughs> yeah, it, for sure. It seems like the skill cap that I've seen in SCA does does go, on average, it, it aims significantly higher than what we generally have in Amp Garden. Um, I know one of the one of the people we've interviewed on this show before, and one of the people who I think is a a laurel in the SCA is uh, here is known as Dame Linden. I don't know what they go by in the SCA. Um, but they make scrolls, and I'm, I'm looking at the scrolls in your background. Um, well, I only have those are those are uh, I would say just lo- little local awards. I've got fancier ones in other rooms, you know. But yeah, <laughs> I, really nice and fancy ones. My wife actually does uh, some of the uh, some of the illumination, calligraphy, and stuff too for scrolls. I mean, that's kind of a nice cap to my point, though, because if those are your your kind of local scrolls, those are amazing scrolls. Like those are things that in Amp Guard we'd be like, you know, oh my god, psyched to mm-hmm. get. Yeah, definitely um, the one that's. Uh, yeah, okay. The the Spock being, uh, I think. Live long and prosper. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you yeah. can't see it. I'm gonna nerd out, but I've got a sign. You can't see it. Oh, never mind. The picture up here is a Babylon Five. It's got uh, oh, three of the Psycor members, including uh, uh, oh, who is it? Walter Koenig's character. It's all, mm-hmm. yeah, all yeah. autographed. Ah, that's awesome. um, but yeah, these are, I mean, I've got, we definitely have fancier scrolls than these. These are just kind of like, it was like, I need to fill up wall space in a weird kind of way. So I just threw them in here. <laughs> well, my mom, I got these scrolls and there's better ones I have, but she like decided to give me a gift and get these framed and stuff, you know, pay all the money. So I was like, oh, okay, yeah. let's hang these up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I mean, they're super cool. Now we've been talking about all of the money that you can spend on, uh, on gear, but you mm-hmm. mentioned me- uh, minimums, gear minimums earlier. So mm-hmm. what would be the minimum amount that you need to have in order to be able to participate? Well, I, I would think as what in the combat arts yes. thing or just, in, all right. So uh, armor combat is probably, of the two disciplines between rapier and, and armor combat is more, probably the more spendy in some degree um, because you have to have a helmet with a, a, a bar visor or something similar that won't let a sword go through. There are, you know, uh, less than an inch kind of gap kind of thing. Um, a gorget, neck protection, mm-hmm. uh, some kind of ri- rigid kidney belt with padding, uh, rigid elbows and knees, um, and a cup if you're, if you're a man. 
Um, we do recommend women have the female version of that as well, because no one wants to get hit on that bone with a rattan yeah. stick. Um, uh, wrist and hand protection, like demi gauntlets or gauntlets, depending on your discipline. And I think that's it. But of those things, the vast majority of that you can make yourself, right? So with a, you could go get a really thick weight lifters belt and put rigid plates on it and maybe some padding underneath it. Uh, the helmet, you know, unless you weld really good, just buy it. And you can get, uh, you know, you could buy a nice one for about 200 some dollars. That's not bad. Uh, you know, you just want to spend more. You certainly can do that. It won't necessarily be the best one. It won't be your first one. It's sort of like your 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 beginner helmet, um, and then the, the demi gauntlets. Or I've I've got leather patterns. You can find them on uh, different sites like Armor Archive. I think they have different patterns out there uh, where you can make them your own. So you go to Tandy, you buy some leather, and you make almost all your stuff of your own. And people kind of like that. Coat of plates. You can do it with get plastic barrels. Cut them into squares and put them in a coat of plates you know make lamellar that way out of you know kydex right. which gets a little pricey but people do that as well or they buy you know just all kinds of stuff so yeah i mean i think you could get away with probably spending no more than like say 300 dollars, maybe a little bit more and you've got everything you need for a long long time yeah. i really then, i really like that sca is not necessarily scared of the the price conversation yeah because yeah, amp guard is very like oh if you're broke you can play amp guard it's practically free you can get in and that's not bad like they, they both have their their pros and cons but whenever we talk about like you know um barriers of entry yeah when we talk about like oh well that's too expensive i can't you know we had uh and we still have amp guard shops selling swords for you know a hundred dollars ninety dollars something wow. like that and people you know they they bat their eyes at it they act like it's crazy but it's really good stuff and and i like that sca isn't necessarily afraid to to have that and and have it as an open part of like yeah it cost about this much for a decent kit but you get what you pay for yeah yeah well, they also have to make sure that people don't die. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I respect Seriously that actually. Hurt or something, and, and that's uh, we have people that, and I, you guys do it too. But we have people that inspect your gear. Mm-hmm. Every, you're supposed to inspect it every practice before events, you know, before fighting commences to make sure it's safe. You know, because you're going to miss stuff. You might miss stuff. You know that of your own equipment. Hopefully, you don't. How do arrows work in your game? Do you have archery as a as a separate thing, or does it get included in your your large battles? How does how does that work? There is target archery. Okay. So it's like a point based system. Uh, ICAC is just almost like I think uh, you know uh, schools have the same thing where you're shooting out of range and you're getting points. They do novelty shoots with the same thing. They're just where they're shooting, you know, just f- having fun with shooting. You know, yeah. Stuff and like that. And these would be but real arrow hits, right? These would be real arrows. Yeah. Okay. Now, on the armor combat, and technically some kingdoms do archery for rapier as well, um, they use uh, mostly, uh, uh, and, and disclaimer, I'm, I don't know everything on, you know, everything about the SCA, so <laughs> yeah, if yeah. I say something wrong, I, I you know, whatever. No, that's fine. Um, they use uh, usually fiberglass shafts. They have these things on the back that are not feathers, not fletches. They're called uh, APDs, anti-bounce anti-bounce back device yeah and they're weird looking round things that if the air were to bounce weird it wouldn't go in your helmet at all so oh, it's, it's calibrated to not go in that the heads themselves are usually really thick round things that are very like round and cumbersome and they make the flight worse yeah Poop. Mm-hmm. um Used 35 pound one. bows at most you're right <laughs> 35 pound uh, uh, pull bows. Crossbows are like off, usually off the hook. Like I would rather get hit with arrow point blank range than a crossbow from fifty feet away. Interesting, because yeah. ours is all day long. For yeah, that. I, you and I were talking at the park the other day about some of the crossbows mm-hmm. that you know. I I was telling you a story about one of the ones that I had seen in a video from Penzik where someone's popping up and firing over their brother's shoulders, and it sounds like a gun going off when it hits the armor on the other side those crossbows are real crossbows yeah now some people do make like sports style because maybe you can't pull yeah whatever yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. They, even the real ones they give they might have uh, aluminum spars you know the actual crossbow part might mm-hmm. be aluminum so it's easier to pull but in the grand scheme of things those are real crossbows they move it like i think I want to say the calibration that they were doing the speed thing and they were like 600 feet per second or something. Huh. 
which you know granted the range is not great but if you're if i can shoot you relatively close i mean if you ever guys play paintball like we would limit on fields 200 feet per second because mm -hmm. anything above that a paintball just it's just ridiculously painful yeah. yeah so you can imagine a crossbow bolt going with a, a shaft that there is some give in it but your guys's arrows feel like you're getting hit with clouds yeah yeah <laughs> Our, ours especially with the crossbows it feels like i'm getting slugged with something this big around <laughs> <laughs> i mean it will leave bruises you get hit if you get hit like here your whole arm will go numb oh, shit. you know just stuff like that it's insane so that's why i ran on crossbows I, I i think people should be able to do what they need to do want to do you know from a sports standpoint but it seems like they get they get away with some stuff whereas with the poor guys with the bows they have to like aim really funky because all their safety things don't let them shoot very accurately or, or very far weird so it's like they've gotten nerfed because of the rules and stuff they're sort of nerfed but the crossbows it works perfectly for them hmm. you know and it's just sort of weird yeah huh. i mean there was one uh you know i know this technically you have a segment at the end to talk about stories i don't know keep going yeah, yeah i don't know you can but at any point <laughs> there was this thing me and uh me and ostrich we went up, he's one of our local guys we went up to this practice in another kingdom north of us and we were doing this weird Y thing where if you died in – there's three groups. And if you died in one, you'd rotate and go to the next group and fight and rotate. Interesting. So there would be a weird thing. So if one group got really good and killed everyone, that whole group would probably flow around and become part of another team. But there was one dude with a crossbow there. And he – because there was only one dude with a crossbow, he just stayed as a fix and placement on one side. And I, I think, Flo, you said it. You know, he, he shot. He shot a guy's shield. It – it sounded like a gunshot, you know, across from us. It deflected so hard it hit people. People called themselves dead, and it, well, they didn't need to from the rule set, <laughs> but it hit so hard it was like bam, dead. And we, as a group, our our Y and the one across from us that was opposite of that one, we like looked at each other and said, "Okay, those guys got to die because we're gonna kill that crossbow." <laughs> yeah. And we we yeah. it was like a silent like, "Yeah, let's go." <laughs> And we, we, we killed them because it was ridiculous how, how hot that crossbow was. Interesting. So, uh, Oh, wait. Oh, go ahead. We also do um, um, siege weapons. Oh, cool. How, so how? ballistic catapults, uh, so scorpions. What's the projectile? That's yeah, the... I was going to say, we have some of those things too, but they're basically couch cushions, yeah. for lack of a better... Um, they can be pretty beefy tubes if they're especially if they're like a, 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 a ballista and they're like this big around and i don't know what they're made out of but they hit they they will knock you back if you get hit with it so not um, the if it's from the shafts. catapult yeah the it's not tubes. the goal it's yeah. bigger than that it's like probably like cardboard tubes with some kind of funky thing on the end of it um big rubber um boulders that get launched with the catapults <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. that if you get hit, you know, mm -hmm. you're going to feel it. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they, they, people are nice and they tape a bunch of tennis balls together and make like something like that that can be launched. They launch a bunch of them. That almost <laughs> sounds like a grape shot. Like when it hits something, it's yeah. going to like scatter and go everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> and, and on those, it's a weird rule set. But if, you, if it bounces off the ground and still hits you, you're still dead. It doesn't yeah. matter where yeah, you hit you, you're dead. Our siege weapons yeah. are like that, too, well, until our, they stop. Our arrows are that way, and a lot of the stuff yeah. like that, too, because there, there was a time at one point where they weren't, where if it hit the ground, it was dead. Um, but it caused a lot of confusion of, like, well, did this come off the ground? Am oh, I yeah. legged? And things like that. So, like, as much as it doesn't really make sense for a playability aspect, it it does in the long run. Kind we of subscribe to the William Tell School of Archery. <laughs> <laughs> so we talked quite a bit about the combat here. What if someone was interested in getting into the arts and science in some way, which you had said earlier probably makes up the majority of SCA. How mm. would they go about doing that? Um, probably the first step is just to be active locally and find out what people are doing locally, what classes they're doing, um, what events are happening, um, those types of things. Cause almost every event has uh competitions or or themes that they want people to submit stuff and based on the theme um for not necessarily judging just submit stuff we'll give you a cool prize you know there's 
there's categories, you know, you start getting these upper level stuff where you do get judged. Ultimately, you're going down that path. You want to show off what you can do. And they have these uh, fairs, they call them, which are very casual. We get feedback as a as an artist where you're you're doing research and you're showing what your research is or you're doing, you know, hands on uh, arts kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, and then ultimately, there are the the big events like Artsy Crown or the arts and sciences events where they are more formalized and there are huge categories and stuff like that. Um, there are people that it's amazing. You know, you talk about scrolls or people that they are, they are true artists in every sense of the word. And they just develop some crazy stuff that most mortal people can never do. <laughs> and eventually, and ultimately they're going to be, you know, laurels, you know, before too long, because you, know, you know, it's, they're just badasses on that. Now, there is a there is a weird paradigm that happens sometimes. If someone's an artist in mundane life, you know, we call it mundane life, non-SCA stuff. Yep. Um, sometimes, depending on how, sometimes I've seen where they get sort of uh, not as much credit for being artists. Same as our as, game. Yeah. It, it's, it's sort same. of, it's just a weird thing because can they do better art than you? Yeah, they're, they're okay. They're better artists than you, no matter what they do in real life. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's sort of a weird thing because um, everyone comes into the game, you know, maybe you, you have a certain physicality about yourself. You know, you come in, you've, you, you know, did wrestling. You... Hey, guys, uh, we had some brief technical issues. Uh, I blame them entirely on Zoom. Um, we're going to continue the rest of the episode. Uh, we had a brief break and then we picked back up. We're going to be audio only for the finale here. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, we'll just have some graphics in the background. If you're on Spotify, nothing will fundamentally change. So just letting the uh, visual uh, folks know what's going on here and we'll be good to go. Usually if I, someone like that's really athletic, they, they like, damn, that guy's a badass. He can do this, this, and this. And it's great. It works for them. But if you're an artist, then it's like, yeah, it's a really dumb thing. It is. It is. Yeah. And uh, sorry for anyone if this is a little bit of a, a jump there. We had a little bit of a technical problem, but we're back now. So, um, yeah, yeah that we experience a lot of the same thing in AmpGuard as well, where things that you do in mundane life, you know, if you do those things in the game, sometimes it's maybe unfair. It's not uh, rewarded in the same way that it would have been if you wouldn't have done those things yeah. in your mundane life. And I find it just as odd as, as you do. The does three... the does the SCA have, uh, like, I know you have vendors, right? But do some of those vendors, are they also, like, uh, laurels or something along those lines? Do they get a um, kind of negative feedback for uh, selling their wares as opposed to just making them? Sometimes, yeah. It, it, yeah, sometimes, for sure. Um Sometimes uh, it's a way for profit because if you're a costuming laurel, and there's all kinds of categories for laurels because anything oh, you do, but if you're a costuming laurel, you're known for your stuff. Then, then you once you start selling stuff, you could you know make good money, making you know very historically accurate clothing and then sell it for really good money. Mm -hmm. But on the flip side, if you make the stuff and you just sell it and you never enter competition, then you might never be a laurel. Sure. So you have to you have to play the game. You have to enter, enter the competitions and show and and sometimes being have, being an associate of someone is is I wouldn't say it's always necessary, but it it, it it feels like that sometimes. And when I mean by you know like you guys have associates too. It's you know if you have if you're a knight, you have squires. Mm -hmm. Right. We we use that as a general term for associate. You know, squires or um, you know someone that's un, under you. Uh, you know, as a peer, um, because they end up being your voice on certain panels, you know, you are my associates uh, <laughs> minions. That's just a good generic term. Yeah. Is that why <laughs> I'm handcuffed term. to this briefcase all the time? Yes. Yeah, associate. <laughs> um, you had mentioned like on the way or kind of on the grind kind of aspect to, um, the Laurel and, and knighthood and stuff like that. Is there like an award system, like a, a kind of a box top, so to speak, or, or something along those lines, like, uh, that you kind of go through, or is it purely a semi subjective kind of thing? <laughs> there are, uh, grades of awards along the different paths. So, um, your first award, generally speaking, if you show up a lot, things like that you might become a lord 
is a, a word of arms. You, you have Lord or Lady as a title. Huh. Um, that's sort of a generic thing. But once you start getting into disciplines or different wars, every kingdom has their own series of names. Mm-hmm. They're very similar. Some are different. Um, but you get different levels of wars. And as you be- become more of a badass or more noted as an artist or whatever, they'll start giving you awards. And it's kind of weird because sometimes there's sometimes an assumption that you have an award. Well, I've known this person for 10 years. It does awesome art. They don't have this other award, this lower level award. So they play catch up sometimes if they catch that because they're like, well, let's nominate her for this other award. Wait, she doesn't have this old one that she should have got, you know, five years ago. <laughs> so they do play catch up sometimes. When yeah, they we said they have the same problem. Yeah, it yeah. Absolutely happens in Amp Guard as well. And, and it's just, you know, there's each kingdom, like I said, there's so many wars in each kingdom. There was some, I, I think I'm better at, but there were some courts I attended where someone got an award I'd never heard of. I'm like, what is that award? <laughs> you know, because <laughs> there's, you know, you can imagine um, for service, I think there's uh, four types of awards, huh. you know, you know, and then there's these weird niche ones that are older ones that people kind of fell out of favor or don't remember. You know, it's just all over the place. So, yeah, there's lots of awards for you, sure. You mentioned uh, like courts and, and, you know, people giving awards and things like that. How does leadership in your game work out? Um, do you appoint a king? Is there a is there an elected person? How does that work? So um, you, you can say, and I'm sure you guys do the same way, you have people that actually effectively run everything. You're, we call them seneschals for each kingdom or each there's seneschals at kingdom level, barony level, shire level. And those are your, like your, your CEOs of that particular group. Yeah. You've got, um, uh, um, people that, you know, it's sort of like a business thing. You got people that do exchequer that deal with the money. You've got different, uh, officers that deal with the fighting and blah, 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 blah. blah. But the king, king or queen, depending is, uh, and, almost every instance I can think of is done by a uh, right of combat. Oh, crown list, uh, crown list tourney. Um, there's actually one coming up not too far from now, um, for the heirs. And the way it works is you, if you fight in it, you have to submit like, here's here, here, here I am. And here's my consort who is going to be your queen or king, depending on how that's aligned up. Okay. I'm going to fight in this. If I win, I'll be prince and princess for six months. And then, and then after that, I'll get, um, I'll be crowned and be king and queen for six months. And then I step down and then I have to wait. If I want to fight again, I have to wait, I think six months. So I've get a cool off period and I can fight again if I want to do that. Interesting. So So your leaders actually have kind of a buildup period where they're working underneath the current king and uh, queen i like that and that's so they and that's so if you're brand new to everything and you're just a hot fighter and you happen to win crown which you you know <laughs> it's probably the worst case scenario depending for you <laughs> um you you do have the ability to apprentice in a, in a weird way under the king current king and queen see what they do understand how it all works a little bit better before you get kind of thrust into it all because mm-hmm. it's a very it's a very uh you know, I know you guys have events and you, you have uh, someone that's a king and all that that gives out awards and stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, it's obviously a very public facing kind of thing. Yeah. They can actually, to some degree, make rules. The kings and queens have the ability to make rules within limits that to, or change rules within limits. So they can change the wording of certain things. There's some, you know, some bureaucracy related to that but they can do things they can actually make peers in most cases yep even if their order says no this person shouldn't be a peer the king or queen can actually make a peer even if the order says no this is entirely amped guard we have the exact same thing where we We have we have our circle of knights and we have to consult with them about whether or not we're going to make a new knight and then uh the monarch can just overrule it um, the reason I bring this up is we just had an election in Winter's Edge, and Teflon is now the uh, the king of Winter's oh, Edge nice. or the Empress. What are you going to go with, Sire? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. It doesn't matter to me one way or the other. And <laughs> and and Lucas at uh, Cabbage is now our very first senator. Uh, we oh. actually have a national level where you're dealing with rules changes for the uh, organization as a whole. And the senator position is the one that handles that. 
yeah, okay. dealing with the yeah. national level stuff. We have a board, basically our board of directors does that and sort of like a volunteer kind of thing. Like he wants to be silly enough to do this job and you have to submit. And they, <laughs> Very they, similar they to ours. Yeah, yeah, they definitely vet and everything. I can't help but, but feel attacked, but you're not wrong. <laughs> yeah. The weird thing about the, the weird thing about the uh, winning by right of combat is you, you can get someone as a hot stick and, and, and they can do some, you know shenanigans big time within the rain and there's very little that anyone can do about it and it has happened before there's been some uh definitely discontent you know being voted on feels like you know at least the group overall says yep yeah, we recommend this person to that but you know by winning crown by right of arms there's none of that it's just whoever wins is is it you got to deal with the repercussions we moved away from that in amp guard for that that very reason Mm -hmm. because you know one person with zero percent of the vote could beat somebody who has 90 percent of the vote um right is that something that you ever expect to change or is that just tradition is a diehard thing in sca yeah i mean well the other joke is is that um it's an arm it's armor combat only so who's who, you know so it gives it's sort of like the the real joke is is that all the peerages are pretty equal except for knights they're more equal ah yeah <laughs> because they can they're the ones you know it, that can be crowned did you just now give us an animal farm quote <laughs> all animals are equal what was it all animals are equal pigs are just more equal than others i have actually not read it i was <laughs> forced to read Animal Farm in high school and forgot it all after oh, writing my report. It's a good book. Everyone go read Animal Farm. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> well, but that's really what it, that's really the thing with that is like, you know, it's, it's, you get a knight that wants, that's really good. And it doesn't have to be a knight, but yeah, they're more equal on certain mm-hmm. things, especially since they're the ones that most likely can fight for crown and can do whatever they want afterwards. Now does leadership in your game confer a peerage as well? I, I think it's a natural thing if you're a leader and you do things and you lead, you will be recognized for it. Okay. Um, cool. There are uh, barony. You can become a court baron, which is sort of you know it's it's just honorific. You know, um, you can get awards. You can be inducted in certain orders that have some precedents to say yeah you're you're hot shit kind of guy. Uh, there's even a award uh, an award out there that's. Um, gosh, I'm trying name of it but basically it's like you a pillar you are a pillar of the society of this kingdom which means like you are the shiznit it's super rare you know kind of thing like that i like that and we haven't even talked about personas at all or anything (laughs) i think i was gonna we were gonna get there you know almost backwards right because i was about to ask you like we have fighting companies which is like a group of fighters who who fight together and it's kind of their thing right i don't know you had mentioned households um earlier but i was gonna try and see if you can expand on that just a little bit because i imagine we've probably stolen it from the sea to be perfectly honest but whole cloth yeah yeah, yeah. i i would i would agree i mean households are basically they can be anything they can be just an association of people you know whether they're a fighting household which is pretty common mm-hmm. um but those fighting households as you probably find out they do more than just fight together they do crafts and hang out party whatever yeah um you've got households that are they're all a and s people that's that's their drive they want to get together and cook and sew and do all kinds of stuff you know you know whatever they want to do um typically um it's not i i could start a household i'm not a peer but i could start a household no problem you know, it's just an association. A lot of times peers do start households and they sort of start that once they start getting an associate and apprentice or something like that. Okay. But they also get other people that they they want to help guide that you're you don't have that formal association with. And so they sort of build households that way. It's almost like building in a weird way kind of a power base. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, you might gobble up the a bunch of artisans around you that are new but you know, brand new but really good and and guide them along the path and it's sort of notable if you're one of your household members becomes a peer you're like i you yeah know, i sired this person basically I that's our boy yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I birthed this person <laughs> into the world <laughs> yeah we get a little bit of that in amp guard as well um 
and then so what's that lineage thing yeah you know, from yeah. a nice standpoint and that that applies for all the different uh peerages as well they care about that then gotcha well so to to segue from that to kind of personas or or as we would have them in amp guard personas um it is not a, a mandatory thing, but in Amped Guard, typically uh, you have a, a name that you get from your knight. So this is is Flow uh, Flow Bojan Thunderhammer, and then Squire Teflon Frosthammer, and then Squire Cabbage Tidehammer. Is there um is there a system like that, or how do how do you how does building your personas and building your uh, sort of character in the SCA go? Well, we definitely don't push people into getting a persona per se. Just want, you know, when you're coming in, you want you to just understand what the SCA is about before you get kind of embroiled in that. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, some people pick it up because they want to just pursue sort of research about a particular culture and a time period and things like that. So they sort of nod to that. Um, you, you kind of get a lot of approaches here. For example, I've always been interested in German stuff. I want to have a German persona, Lens Connect, which is sort of like the punk rockers of the medieval period, mm-hmm. the way they dress and stuff like that, and just do that. So I sort of adopted a name that's similar, would be appropriate. I'm not me. I'm, you know, we do get asked, is this a LARP? And it's not really a LARP. I mean, you could argue it sort of is, there's roles and stuff. But I'm just I just go by a different name on the field like you guys do. Yep. But I'm not adopting a character unless I want to affect that. You know, mm-hmm. I wanna talk in a the German accent or talk German. It's not definitely not a requirement. Um It seems more like it's it's just to keep you in that spirit while you're yeah, at the event. Keep sure. you uh, you know, yeah. in that medieval period, keep you fighting, that kind of thing. Yeah, sort of yeah, sort of, yeah. Uh, I, I made note earlier at the very beginning about how sometimes people can affect other people because like, you know, Vikings around this area are pretty big mm-hmm. because, mm-hmm. you know, Barony Thor's mountain and strange Viking, that. Yeah. Strange that, but also Viking stuff is a lot of people like it. it's pretty easy. It sort of harkens back to, you know, you know, a better time, if you will, you know, make Norway a, great again kind of thing yeah. um, <laughs> when, when my people <laughs> when my people would travel down to the UK yeah, and yeah. liberate those monasteries from the hands of the invading monks that were controlling exactly. them those Catholics exactly. <laughs> and, 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 and uh, media affects that too because mm-hmm. if you have the show Vikings mm-hmm. which is basically science fiction as far as I can tell <laughs> yeah I mean, it's, there's some crazy shit happens in it. There are some nods to some real stuff. People kind of glom on that and say, that's cool. I want to do that. Or, you know, if you watch, um, you know, what was the one? Oh, shit, I'm spacing on it. The When Game you know, of Thrones someone, came out, it... That's a it, weird one, but... It like, affected Amp Guard so greatly yeah, because everyone yeah. immediately thought that they were, uh, I don't know, master political Ugh. intrigue. <sighs> oh. it, it was... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we... We don't get that kind of thing. It's more like an ode to it. Like if the if there's a movie about the Crusades and mm-hmm. it's a cool movie, people want to be Crusaders. Yeah, you know, just stuff like that. So that's sort of like they like sort of glom onto it. But I, I tell people, you know, the essay is really weird because you could have a six foot three black dude that's a Japanese persona, sure, which yeah. is like legit, or you can have a a um, you know Aztec. There's one guy out there as an Aztec warrior. Ooh, that's that's cool. cool. I love that. You know, he's, yeah. he's, he wears a Jaguar suit and he fights heavy and fights rapier. And, that's pretty cool. You know, so it's, it's sort of, and that's sort of a weird thing. The SCA is defined. I think they've sort of floated the dates around a little bit, like 650 AD to like, uh, oh shoot, I'm forgetting. Uh, it has to be 1560 century. or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like right, right at the age of the end of, of chivalry. Um, but any place touched by uh, Europe, so that's where the definition. That's why you can have Aztec because they were definitely touched by Europe at a certain point in their time period. They were touched <laughs> to death touched by to Europe a lot. <laughs> yeah, a lot. Yeah. And, I, I wonder when For Honor came out. The the there's a game called For I Honor. Remember Did that, that divide your game into three sections? Because For Honor had uh, straight medieval knights, it had uh, samurai warriors, and then it had Vikings. And those were the three sort of like subclasses you mm-hmm. could play. Did that split your game in three? Oh yeah. man! It, it, but out west, where you and then by the way, there's actually I looked at there are twenty kingdoms. All oh. all continents are are touched. Oh, there's even oh. a like 
New Zealand, Australia, and part of Antarctica is one kingdom. Look at <laughs> um, so all the continents are touched. I have questions about the Antarctica one <laughs> nope. real quick. <laughs> nope. Um, There's polar bases down there, and people, you know, it's there. Yeah, it's funny. Just, we we fought for five the- minutes at noon. Yeah, what do you spray the inside of your helmet with Pam so you don't no. stick to it? Like <laughs> they've got gems in those things. Those oh, yeah. they've okay. got gems and stuff in them. Yeah, but um, shit, I forgot where I was going with that. With the original thing. Welcome to the show, um, <laughs> right? Squirrel. Yeah, yeah. Anyways, we do that to people. <laughs> um, yeah, there's just a, a lot of stuff. So yeah, as far as what people pick personas, they just pick what they want to go with. There, you can actually. Uh, I've not done it yet. I've sort of been tempted because I always joke if I would found out about the SCA before I, I, when I was still in the Marine Corps, when I was on the West coast, I would have been a Japanese persona. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, so people actually do, I've heard of people doing multiple personas because they just want to explore and play around with the, yeah, do they get different armor sets and stuff for armor it sets, and- clothing, everything, you know, so I would have been a Japanese cause I had access to Japan. I could have bought all the, male kimonos i could have you know carried and just <laughs> yeah. had all the stuff and the armor and i actually was taking sword training there and all that stuff so you know but i i just kind of glommed on to the german side as well um it's just really an exploration of the time period and what they did more than anything you know well and and also your um both the the scope of your events and also just the the way that your game is structured it seems like the um, what's a good way to say this? The role play is kind of inherent to the exercise. The because everything is of a certain time period, and because everyone is expected to, you know, sort of within some boundaries work within that time period, it sort of benefits the the scenario as a whole. Whereas in Amp Guard, um, you can have dudes running around in, in Nike Air Force Ones and neon green garb, and it doesn't really indicate medieval. Right. You know. Well, I, w- I I would argue that uh, for the most part, there is no role play. Um, I, I don't, most of the people don't try to affect any kind of accent or any kind of anything. That's just know? smart in general. Yeah, it's just they're <laughs> just being themselves for the most part. There can be some instances, but usually it's it's kind of rare. Mm-hmm. Um, so f- you know, you just learn or try to remember another name. I'm terrible with names, so I have oh, me to go. Too. Um, so if I stick with one name, if it's just SCA name or mundane name, I have to stick with one. And I'll even do that SCA event. So if I know someone by their mundane, I'll be like, Zach, get over here. I mean, uh, Oster, get over here. You know, <laughs> yeah. That. Now, there is a big joke, and you talked about name assignments, things, you know, if you don't pick a name. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We always joke if after X amount of years, like three years, five years, if you haven't picked a name yet, we're going to pick one for you. Uh huh. You wait three yeah. years? Maybe. Well, I don't know. We, we don't really ever do that. Eight and a half minutes. You have eight and a half minutes from <laughs> oh, the time gosh. that you join the guard to have a name ready to go, or you will be assigned one. Yeah, otherwise, some asshole names you cabbage. <laughs> that was Gillen, by the way. Yeah, thanks, bud. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a forced thing. You know, we don't force people to have goofy nicknames. I wasn't forced to take on a hammer name. It's just sort of a tradition that, you know, some of us like upholding. Yeah, yeah. Not everybody does. Well, yeah. uh, I was going to say there are uh, some people, if they are, um, I, I think there's a great, in some degree, having like a cooling period where people don't pick a name and understand what's happening mm-hmm. helps them pick a better name and a better persona than they might have done at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So they're not stuck with a name. But I've seen people do like the old uh, Norse style where they're like so and so son. So that their yeah. knight is so and so. So they're so and so son. Uh-huh. Yeah, you know I'm I'm, Sven. So they've Sven done that. like that. Sven, Sven is Sven Randelson. Uh, uh-huh. I believe. Yeah. So Randall, it was his whatever peer or knight or whatever. I kind of like that. Yeah, and they actually you cannot you know, be flosen cabbage flosen <laughs> on, on the aside like those countries stopped that but once they started instituting like a social security number now they're doing it again they actually yeah. are allowing people to do that so that's why for a long time you saw a bunch of fixed names and they weren't really really related to each other <laughs> there's yeah. actually um this is weird but i i just recently watched a documentary where um it was it was talking about Japan specifically in that time period where the U.S. sort of forced them to open up and you know that that whole uh, modernization period where they also didn't have a system like that they really didn't have like a fixed last name system and suddenly they had to choose last names so a lot of Japanese last names to this day are just something that someone picked in like 1895 and they said that's going to be our family name forever 
Huh. And because unless you were like royalty or something like that, you just didn't have like it wasn't a thing that you were yeah. John from that village. Yeah. And, and it, you get that. Yeah, that's a medieval name, you know, uh, Rowan from whatever. Yeah. yeah. And people do that, too. I just happen to be from an enlightened age where I have actually real names. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. But if I'm Spanish, if I'm a Spanish person, I've got a lot of names. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and that's fun. That's fun to kind of do that sometimes kind of play up to that. That's maybe some of the role play. You're like, you know, Jose, la, 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 la. Meanwhile, yeah, yeah. you know, just it's bragging really, but. And it sort yeah. of contributes to your mythos and, and all of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like you can, it's almost, I, I imagine it's very hard to be in it and not of it when it comes to just like being in that scenario. Even if you're not affecting an accent, you're still, um, you know, you're still in this time period while you're there. It helps. Yeah, it yeah. helps for sure. Yeah. But, you know, you can have in an event, you could have uh, uh, someone who's Roman besides someone who's Elizabethan. Yeah, I've seen Doctor Who. <laughs> yeah. So that's, yeah. <laughs> It's so an SCA documentary for sure. Yeah, that's yeah, for sure. <laughs> for sure. Um, so I want to recap uh, uh, kind of the some of the highlights as I see them from uh, uh, from the interview. And thank you so much again for coming on. Yeah. I learned that we actually have a lot more in common with SCA than we do some of the other Boffer games Holy that shit, are... Yeah. That are that are by timeline much closer to us, or that we stole from, <laughs> all of them that we stole from. Um, <laughs> the, uh, quick things to review here: if you are a new person and you're interested in doing SCA, um, you do have uh, some minimums that you will need to look into if you want to do combat. But most, if not all, parks will have some loaner gear for you to try it out. Um, to find your local park, uh, I would suggest either going to come try LARP and seeing if the SEA group is registered there, or uh, is there a good place for people to go to find a local SEA group? SEA.org. SEA.org. Um, just find your, there's a section you look for your local group. You go by state or country and then go, go that way. You have four different types of combat that you can participate in. Um, they range uh, primarily on the types of armor and the types of weapons that you'll be uh, using, though I'm sure there are some nuances that we didn't completely get into in this episode. Um, you have uh, arts and sciences that you can get into as well. And if I did not misunderstand you, much of the arts and sciences uh, isn't just the creation part of it, though I'm sure that that's a big part of it, but you mentioned research multiple times. People are researching this particular period or this particular object that they're looking into creating, and that seems just as valuable as the creation process itself. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we, uh, I, I did a class where this lady was a, a structural engineer, and she was talking about trying to recreate uh, Roman concrete. Oh, yeah, there you had go. Some examples, and we we played around with some examples of how to do it. And mine mine evidently sucked out. My policy <laughs> <laughs> would have fallen down, but you know, uh, just stuff like that. It's just understanding the past, um, you know, and then we, recreating it the best we can because we, you know, there's a lot lost to history, mm -hmm. and yeah. there's stuff they just didn't write down. They yep. just didn't write it down. Um, so they just knew how to do things and we just make assumptions and try to do the best. That's where the creative part comes in. Yeah. It's yeah. like, yeah, you know, and also the joke is, well, if they had Velcro, they would have used it. So we're going to use Velcro over here, you know, the kind of <laughs> you know, and I, I would say, you know, uh, hearing, you know, cause I, I've played around with Zeb and we could do a whole episode of me trying to beat up on Zeb on the, on, on yeah, we could. Why haven't we been doing that? Yeah, why haven't we <laughs> but, been doing that? <laughs> but um, I, I think, I, and I, in some degree, I think of you guys, you guys have your own thing going on, but this is sort of, the SA is almost sort of the next level for you guys. You know, if you like combat, specifically combat, but all the other disciplines for real, it would be the next level for you because the events are just way tired of the, um, you know, this is the feedback I've got from Zeb and, and uh, uh, E and all those guys. Just, mm -hmm. Everything is just way tighter, way it's it's different between like, uh, you know, uh, it, it's just like minor league versus major league. The yeah. divergence is almost like um, the realism divergence, right? Like 
we have amp guard kind of in the middle of the LARP structure and we have the lightest touch on the other side, the, like the other spectrum of SCA. So if you're looking to do kind of more of the, the role play and like look like an elf or a this or a that or whatever, then you're likely to be more attracted to uh, amp guard to lightest touch. But if you're looking to be more historical and, and look, then you're probably going to look from amp guard to SCA and yeah. amp guard being kind of the bridge because we're trying to get everybody basically um well, yeah and the combat you know if you like fighting and that's just one aspect right you know, we can acknowledge that if you, the fighting is more real mm-hmm. they, they have safety and there are there are sport aspects to it but it's sort of a little bit more real yeah 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 the the weight of the weapons force you to have better body mechanics and things like that too so some of the things that we do we can't really do in sea actually so i just i thought of a great way to illustrate this um zeb uh, he fights Florentine a lot in the SCA, and he tells us that's actually not very common. Um, and in Amphgard, it's it's a bracket in our tournaments. Like, Florentine right. is a common thing. Yeah, rapier, it is common. Uh, but armor combat, it's... There's, a, at least in this kingdom, a lot of people, a lot of the knights go, you need to be a really good sword and board fighter to be considered a good fighter. Yeah. Well, there are obviously people that do glaive and stuff that are really good fighters that have become knights as well. Um, but it's not that common. It's, you know, some people might say it's gimmicky, you know, whatever. I think, you know, I, I've got, uh, I, and I know there's a point where I'm going to, you're going to ask for stories. I can tell you a story about that. Yes. I mean, particular. While, do they Fuck say yes. that it's gimmicky while the uh, inhabitants of the baronies of Thor's Mountain come at them with two axes, as was somewhat <laughs> common in the, you know, uh, it it is. I wanted to hit up on some of the things that I thought were really high points of the episode. That I, especially for someone from AmpGuard who's wanting to go out to an SE event for the first time, um, this is really uh, an extension of your AmpGuard uh, events plus plus. Right, larger vendors uh, row. It's premium AmpGuard. It is. It's premium. <laughs> premium AmpGuard is a great way to uh, mm-hmm. to look at it. And I know that in almost all of these episodes I have touched I've used the word nightlife if we took shots every time I said it we'd all be drunk but um, the uh, go to YouTube and watch some uh, videos of the types of setup for camp that people do and the types of nightlife that exist I'm not even going to try to tell it to you I think that you should just go watch some of the videos they're not very long Um, just look up uh, you know SEA campfire SEA night uh, nightlife and this is it, this is people really going around and telling the old school uh, stories, historical old school stories, and cooking food over the uh, a big pot in the middle of the camp. It, it's amazing. So you you said you have a, a good story, and it involves Zeb. Did I hear that right? Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got a couple, two good ones. So one that's just yes. SCA, that's not Zeb. <laughs> fair, fair. Um, and it's not, it's not like... It... Disclaimer, none of us put put you up to this i just <laughs> i want that on well, record the funny thing is 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 not me and zeb but I'll, I'll get to that in a second so okay um the little little story about the realism of it we we're doing a field battle which is a big old field battle with a bunch of people on both sides and units and discrete units that work together and i was in a in a um, secondary unit with a bunch of spears and our spears are nine foot long and you can reach out and poke someone you know from over uh, nine feet away mm-hmm. so our main unit went through and swept through the, the uh, this line and in that instance all the people that died laid on the ground mm-hmm. because you can do that you can do like you guys if you can get clear you go to dead and walk out but if you can't do that you're supposed to lay down and, and not be a hindrance and not get and do it in a safe way so if you get stepped on you don't get hurt because there are some big dudes out there um and we're in a second line just following up and i swear to god it was like the realest thing in the world if there had been a little fog on the ground <laughs> it would have been like a real battle because we would have been like poking dudes that were moaning it was that like ridiculously cool with all these dead bodies around and it was just like totally set the scene you're like this is real combat um the story of zeb is is i took him uh we went to this fighter's collegian and he'd been fighting with me for probably by that point a year and a half maybe two years um at, at our fighter practice and took him to fire clean and to get authorized. You have to be authorized to actually fight in one of the tournaments. Again, that's to show that you're mm-hmm. safe. Mm-hmm. Right? And got all that down, and he did some classes from different people there, sort of board stuff, because there's a lot of great experienced people. Well, after the fire collegium, they traditionally have this thing called fight a night, 
right? And you go over and you say, hey, sir, son, so, or so, so, can I fight me and give me some tips? Well, we got there probably, they were all kind of a little tired to take a break, but I was like, hey, I got my new guy here. Would you mind, when you guys mind fighting him? <laughs> and so this knight's like, yeah, I'll fight him. And he's a lanky dude with, you know, a shield and a sword. And they walk off to go fight. And the other knights that, that I know, they're like, oh, a two, you know, two sticker? That'll be, this will be interesting. I was like, oh, just you watch. <laughs> yeah. And the first, like, bam, bam, bam. And he got him. He's like, what? And they just laughed. Oh, he's one of those guys. So they, you know, they knew what was going on after that point. But it was just <laughs> hilarious. Cause, and when they came back, and the, the night uh, that I sent Zeb about to fight and play with, I was like, yeah, I figured something was up after that first shot. <laughs> you know, Zeb's. You know, you know that Zeb is wicked good with that left hand. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, so he just did a rising uh, rap or something, hit that guy in the back of the head. It was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. Then, I'm glad to hear that Zeb embarrasses the knights in your game as much as he embarrasses the knights in in our game. Just in terms of oh yeah, it was straight fun. smoking them on the field. It, it was a setup. I mean, it was all in good fun because anyone <laughs> would have been caught dead. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then there's one battle. I I talked Zeb and E to go on a Gulf Wars field battle, and they were shitting bricks, dude. They were <laughs> not prepared. They were like, oh, "I don't want to do this." I was like, "Here, have my shield." And I think I gave E my shield and the sword. <laughs> and Zeb was running out there with two sticks on a melee, just like afraid for his life. And and yeah, yeah he got he got gunched. Like he tried to block someone a pole axe or something and just got gunched and died <laughs> quicker than shit it was pretty funny yeah i was gonna say one-on-one on one, two sticks sounds okay big field melee absolutely no not. Yeah. yeah i mean you remember the archery thing yeah yeah i remember yeah, the crossbow right. oh thing. yeah <laughs> i remember the crossbow thing and it just makes me shiver yeah i, I still have not i'm i have a goal and and zeb i'm coming for you if he's listening <laughs> I, He's not. I still have I still have a goal for him to get shot with a crossbow just just cause because it is <laughs> it is an experience it's like hazing you should totally experience it in your lifetime you know <laughs> see this will be fun for for us because Flo and I specifically work with him. And so he, he, when we're in the office, he's always showing us his new bruise that he got from, from SCA. Yeah, mostly like, for me. Mostly. Yeah, I was going to say, Travis <laughs> caught me with a, this cross uh, over to the yeah, other look, side. Look at this stripe, and his arm's positively <laughs> blue and green. Yeah. And it's like, oh, God, so I want to see the crossbow welt that he gets after you get him. Oh, uh, yeah, it's bad. But yeah, it's, yeah, mostly for me. That's fun. And I, it's fun listening because I, I learned from him listening about you guys, you know, Amp Guard and the similarities like you said there's so many similarities mm -hmm. that once you went one or the other you could kind of just kind of get it it's very similar. the fighting just system gotta... and like taking shots and stuff seem to be almost identical yeah uh, and things like that too so. oh yeah headshots legal in the... yeah they're legal in the oh yeah ECA. you mentioned oh, yeah. uh, getting and your bell yeah, wrong yeah, yeah. yeah the one of the big differences fight wise is i think that uh at least for your heavy combat you don't take shots below the knees where we knees are below right yep yeah, and hands and that's just a safety thing yeah yeah um you know the hands are most people are keyboard warriors so they don't want their hands gunched up um <laughs> <laughs> you know um the the blade is designated there's edges on it so instead of hitting any part of the blade you have to hit with certain parts of the blade mm -hmm. you know that's the big so like getting used to making sure you hit right is there man I, we actually have yeah. flat blades in amp guard that follow the same kind of rule you have to hit with the the edge, the edge side the of the edge, blade. Yeah. I've seen Zeb getting ready for some of the big events too, and just he'll have like four or five sticks laid out. I was like, man, is it? It what's uh, what's the deal? He said, oh, these will all be broken by the end of the event. Really? Yeah. <laughs> because he goes super light. You know, some tournaments you go super light sticks or tan, where it's not sh the edges, the whole side shaved, and it's it's uh -huh. ultra light, super fast. For uh, you know, for a long time he and that's that'll be a challenge for I think maybe not for Gun if he comes over and maybe not for some of you guys, but for Zed the challenge was calibration because he couldn't hit hard enough for the longest time. <laughs> yeah, I mean he couldn't. I mean it's a mechanic. It's a it's a body mechanic thing. You know he could throw. Hand speed was great, but he just couldn't throw hard enough I, long enough. I love that he was like, yeah, this won't be a problem for Gun. Like yeah, we all know. <laughs> yeah, we. Hey, by the way. Your episode is going to be coming out on Friday, and uh, Warlord Gun mm -hmm. will become Sir Gun the very next day on oh, see, uh, Saturday. See, he can show up on, on Sunday and go play SCA after. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
So uh, congratulations to uh, oh, yeah. to to Gunn for his uh, achievement. I know that he's been working for this for a long time. A long time. Um, yeah. Barony of Thor's Mountain is now ready to accept you as an <laughs> SCA member, which I think is how it works. <laughs> I didn't enough. get an. I didn't Do get the an tassel invite. Tassel and then step aside. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there right. it is. I, I didn't get an invite, but I'm a crown knight, so <laughs> yeah. It sounds like their leadership stuff filled up. It's fine. Yeah, right. Well, and I, I, I wish you know. I wish we were. You know, I know it's a function thing because of the games you play, but I think we would love to play with you guys more and vice versa. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I th- I'm sure you remember. Uh, you know, we we met at you at that one, uh, that one Oak Ridge Park you know, that one time and shows you kind of what we did and vice versa. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I have hard, hard, uh, core train to hit in the head. So that's a challenge to play in your game (laughs) to not do it. Yeah. (laughs) Especially when you're, have a shield and you're like, hey, yeah, poke yeah. It over the top. No, 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 no. You can you can still come over and play. I'm just going to direct you. Uh, oh, yeah, to that's go. fair. Hit that yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah. Hit that guy. No, not me. That that guy. That's fair. That's fair. Man, this is awesome. I actually learned a lot about SCA just mm-hmm. in, in raw similarities that I did not think we would have. Um, are you guys still playing at John Bynan? I know you you guys move sometimes. Where are you guys playing we're, at now? We're uh, we're trying to play around and and just get more exposure out there. Just mm-hmm. have more. So uh, that park there by the Y, John, John Bynum, is sort of, I would say, our base of operations. Mm-hmm. But we're doing like a dare park every once in a while. Oh, shit. Um, we're doing a couple different places out just to let have exposure out there. Dude, it is like if you five don't minutes try, you from don't. my house. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Well, we got armor that'll fit you, dude. No, you I'm, can't. Your back is just... <laughs> yeah, I have back problems, but I'm not saying no. <laughs> I got my good days and my I'm bad days. I'm saying no for him. Oh, is that right? Okay. <laughs> can't stop me. Um, well, you know, you could do an archery, but like... Ding. Yeah, I could, I could be the guy that shoots up with the crossbow. Yeah. This is, <laughs> this is also not okay. No, it's cool. I know where Zeb lives. I can just get him in his house. <laughs> Man, man, I will not. Kill you. I will not hunt you down and shoot you with a crossbow in your own home. I mostly promise. Yeah, you just wait till he gets out of the house. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, <laughs> thanks so much for coming on. Um, again, this was a whole lot of fun. Uh, I think we all learned quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I hope we can hear more stories of uh, Zeb going and killing knights at SCA, getting trampled, and then getting trampled. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll we'll bring you back on after the crossbow incident has happened. Yeah, we could do a okay. whole other episode and, and we'll okay. end up with a story about that. Okay. Uh, yeah, we'd have to film that for sure. Yeah. <laughs> you want to hit that outro? Absolutely. Thanks so much for your time, man. Thank you. Hey everyone, thanks for listening. If you liked what you heard, be sure to subscribe to our podcast on YouTube or Spotify to get notified about new episodes, and make sure to follow us on Facebook for announcements and more.